of the Guitar expert talk. I have a very special guest with us today as we will be talking about the best blues guitar exercises to do as a beginner. So whether you're a beginner or not doesn't really matter because it's always good to check if you covered the basis and that's why we will go through uh, a lot of very useful topics, whether you're a beginner or not. So I'm very excited to present to you Maurice Richard from Canada. Hi, Maurice. Hey, Anthony. How you doing? Great, great. And you? I'm doing awesome. Thank you very much. All right. So you've you have a lot of experience uh, teaching both beginners and advanced guitar players, but you specialize in teaching beginners through your uh, website. You run a website that we'll be sharing later with all things for beginners. And if you can talk a little bit about your approach to what, you, what you're doing with the website and how you came about the things you'll be talking about. Uh, if Maurice Richard is teaching what is the core message in your teaching? Um, all right. So as far as, um, so I, I, I've been teaching guitar for, for a long time. I've taught hundreds of students offline first um, and building from that experience. Um, you know, it's how do I take that philosophy that I've learned and, and try to apply it online? It's not, it's not the same, but 
um, the, the main focus of mine is to help people to actually play. Um, and um, information is great and there's lots of information, but if you can't use it, if you can't play, um, what's the point? So my approach is just grassroots, getting people to put all the, the, the main elements together and being able to actually play something. So I build everything from that premise. Right. Sounds great. And I agree totally. It has to be fun when you're learning the guitar both for beginners and even more advanced but they have their own sets a set of challenges they have other challenges as you know than beginners in general and it's really cool to be talking about uh, the topic of best exercises for blues guitar for beginners and because uh, there's so much out there as you said there's so much information but where do we start if we like you said want to get or students be playing as fast as possible. What are some of the exercises that you do with your students or uh, any other exercises that you would prescribe to someone who just who's just starting out with the instrument and maybe can play a few open chords, but then want to wants to get into blues guitar playing? Right on. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So. Um... What the way I would approach it is um, knowing a few chords is a good thing, but I would want to make sure that people, first of all, can can actually use them properly. Um, and it's not hard to get into blues at this stage. Um, what you can do is you can start with some simple blues chords. Um, but the most important thing is, is to me in music is rhythm. And it's be able to take the chords that you know and apply them to some sort of rhythm, whether it's simple or not. But First, you need to actually know the chords to be able to apply them. Now, I would start, if we want to start about, uh, you know, with blues chords that I would teach people, I would start with some of the simpler ones. Um, there's some two finger chords that you can use and some, um, you know, some three finger chords that are, are fairly simple. Um, and I would start with um, the chords I would pick would be A7, uh, A minor 7, uh, D7, E7, E7. Um, G7 are probably the main uh, first ones. G7 is probably one of the harder ones for beginners uh, because of the, the, the just the way your hand has to, to reach around. Um, and then uh, once you kind of get a grip on those, I'd move to more advanced ones like B7 and C7, things like that. So uh, the most important thing uh, at this stage would be how does someone learn? So how would someone learn new chords um, so that they get them right the first time uh, so that they can use them as soon as possible. So one of the first exercises I teach my students on how to learn chords is uh, this little process that helps them to kind of program that into their brain so that the chord that they're using is the, the proper one, the right technique. So I use what I would call uh, chord push-ups. Um, and we're just going to do it with a, you know, a really simple chord. Um, so let's, uh, let's say we're going to use D7, for example. And D7 is just down here. And you can look this up later. The point is the exercise, what you do with the chord. So you can do this with A7, with any other seventh chord, which are very prominent in blues music. And that's why I would go to seventh chords in this case. So what I would do is I would put my fingers on the right frets, and I would make sure my fingers are all in the correct place. And what I would do is once my fingers are on the strings, I would put no pressure on it first just to relax so that my muscles have the right, um, everything's in the correct uh, order. Uh, you're relaxed because if you're not relaxed, then you can add some really bad habits uh, by using the wrong muscles and compromising. So what I would do is touch the strings, be really relaxed, then push down a little bit. You can't see that probably, but I'm pushing down and I'm holding for a second or two, then I'm releasing. And I would do that five, 10 times, and that will teach your brain to recognize that shape as one entity instead of three different fingers. And you can do that uh, as a warm up. You could do that in between other things that you're, you're playing. And you would just do that for the D7 chord, you know, for, like I said, 10, 20, 30 times, whatever you can do. Um, and then practice some other things. And then maybe later on in the same practice session, you could do another chord like G7. And you would do the same thing. Leg, 
lay down the power, release, down and release. And what that does, again, it's programming all these things into your brain. If it's not programmed properly, um, it's very hard to use it, it's very difficult, uh, and to do it properly. So that's the first thing I would do. Do you have any, uh, any comments on that, uh, Anthony? Do you have any? Yes, totally. And I think it's great that you mentioned the word programming because not a lot of, not a lot of beginners think about this like it's programming your muscles to form the right uh, movements, to get the right movements in our systems. And I oftentimes make the analogy to my students that your fingers are like dancers. They're like doing their little dance on the fretboard. But the question is, if you're the guy who trains the dancers, like the choreograph choreographer, that's a difficult word, sorry. I don't know yeah. English uh, in my mother tongue, but the, you're the trainer of the fingers. <laughs> Let's keep it to that. So if you're the trainer of the fingers, well, have you trained your fingers adequately to perform those movements like a trainer has? Um, and if you're uh, in control of these four dancers, do you go tr through the right uh, motions with them each and every day you practice or are you just going through open courts and then your mind is wandering? If your mind is wandering, then you, the trainer, isn't doing a good enough job of training your dancers, so to speak. So I think at least for myself, that's, uh, that's been an analogy that I like to use a lot in my own practice as well. And I totally oh, yeah. agree on uh, starting out with two or three finger chords. And even for people who have been playing for longer, like I mentioned in the beginning, in the introduction, like you can get a lot of value from detuning out of more advanced stuff. The advanced stuff is great, but oftentimes people are people that are into intermediate levels, <clears throat> they focus heavily on uh, really advanced stuff and they never get back to the root. So such exercises are also good. Uh, nevertheless, uh, your playing level. So a great reality check for yourself is to play a B7 chord. And like Mo said, um, you can look up the chord and I will also share a resource that you can download for free at uh, the end of our conversation with all the fingerings of these chords. But here's the B7 chord. And if you know the chord, that's, that's good. But a good reality check is to look if you can put your fingers in one movement on the chord without going like one, two, three, four. And you want your fingers to move in one motion. Uh, so that's the, the great exercise that Maurice has shared. And I think if you can do it, you can also play each string <coughs> separately and it rings out fine. That's, that's great, you're doing a great job. But oftentimes it's a reality check and we can never, um, we can never let our ego run the show. Like if we go, even if we were playing for more than 20 or 30 years, there are still things like this. We need to check for ourselves if we are able to do it. And we can do the same thing then with more complex chords. And it's a never ending process. But if you allow your ego to step in through, then it, it doesn't work. So that's, uh, a warning for people who've been playing for uh, for years and years. So uh, we need to uh, maintain a beginner's mindset, beginner's mind. And if we think we can do it, then we need to check it. And if you then can do it, well, good job. But never think, well, I should be doing this because a lot of time, even people who play for years can't do a B7 chord in one motion. All right. And I'm also speaking from personal experience because I, I used to be like always looking for the next best thing and trying to get more advanced, but it's your foundation that is also very important, uh, even at the higher levels. So take care of your foundation.
Not sure if you have any thoughts on this, uh, Maurice. I will add one more thing to that, and then I'll I'll move on to another topic. But um, uh, I had some really really bad habits. You know, I played, I taught myself, and um, I think it was after 15 years of playing, um, I was able to correct a lot of my really bad habits on any uh, a lot of chords by using this method. This is how I learned it actually to correct bad habits. Um, I'd given up on certain chords like B7, um, even after playing for a long time. Uh, and using this method, I was able to learn it very quickly. So uh, correcting bad habits uh, and learning new ones, uh, this is a really good way to do it. So that's, that's the thing. And for people who already know how to play and you know you have bad habits, first of all, <laughs> the key is to identify it, to be able to know you have a bad habit and then knowing how to correct it. So this is one way you can do that. Um, the next thing that leads from this is, okay, it's great that you can form a chord. And like Anthony said, you can put your fingers down all at once instead of, you know, doing what we call the spider legs, uh, one, two, three, or spider fingers. Um, the idea is to uh, keep raising the distance from the strings so you can do it all in one motion and all your fingers are landing. But the next thing is we don't want to just use this chord by itself. So if you're going to play a guitar, you're going to change to another chord. So the next step is to, is I'm going to show you how I teach people and how I overcame some, some problems changing chords um, and a great exercise to do that. Now this one takes a little more discipline. So I'll give you the two, the two versions. There's the, you're the disciplined type of person that will sit down and do this uh, step by step exactly the way I say. And for you that are less patient, there's another kind of shortcut. Um, it, it, it's not a shortcut. It's just a smaller process, but it takes longer to get the result. But you feel better as you're doing it. So um, it, it all depends on your personality. You know yourself better than because I don't know any of you. So, so let's say you want to go from uh, a D7 chord and you would like to go to um, another chord. So let's say you want to go to, and we're not going to pick necessarily all just seventh chords, but we could say, let's go to E7, okay, in this case. So I've got a D7 chord. I'm picking easy ones, um, and I want to go to E7. So the way I would teach you how to do this chord change and any chord change would be the first, think about where your fingers are now. So look at where they are, and then visualize where the next chord is. Imagine in your mind your hand moving perfectly from where it is to the new chord. So if you can visualize this in your brain, this will help your, your neural pathways, your brain, to program this movement properly the first time. Now, it's not that cut and dry when you first do a new chord. There will be some, it, it'll be a little shaky, but the more you do this, the better you get at it. So I'm going to look at my D7. It's like, okay, my two fingers, finger one and two, have to go on those two strings up there to do an E7 chord. All right, so I can see my fingers lifting. I can see my two fingers moving and dropping all in one motion. I can see that in my mind. So then I actually do it nice and slow to give my brain the opportunity to build this properly. So up, over, and down. Notice how slowly I did that. That's the key. You have to be very patient. You have to do slowly and you have to do it perfectly as many times as possible. Now, when you first do this, if you've never done this before, you're going to be all shaky. It's going to be all over the map. But very quickly, you'll be able to start getting into a groove. So now let's go back to D7. So I know that finger's got to go over there. That finger's got to go there. And that finger's got to go here. So I'm going to imagine my fingers moving up, moving over and down. So now I'm actually going to do the movement. Boom, boom. And everything moved at the same time. Notice all my fingers I mean, if you want to look at it under a microscope, you'll probably notice the fingers don't land exactly at the same time if you want to be specific. But the point is they all move together, up, over, down. You don't want to go up, hover, 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 down. You don't want to go up, wait, stop, down, correct. You want to do this all in one move. If you make a mistake, that's okay. Don't correct it. Just do it again. So that's the, the principle. And you can do then you can learn very complex chords this way, and you can learn them smoothly and properly the first time. It will take um, some effort. You won't like it not necessarily you won't necessarily uh, learn it that smoothly and at speed uh, in one session. But if you keep doing this, just like the, the push-ups, um, which I would have done before I, I used any of these chords, I would have learned both with the push-ups first to make sure they're imprinted. Uh, and then this makes it a lot easier. 
Then the next step would be to add some speed, then to add some very simple strumming, et cetera. Anyway, now that requires a lot of discipline and patience. Um, and you know what? I'm, I wasn't one of them. Uh, most of us aren't like that. So what you could do instead, you don't have to do all the steps. The most important piece of this is actually committing to the core change. None of this waiting, hovering, whatever. So I'm on D7, I'm going to E7. I'm just going to lift, move, bound. If I make a mistake, whatever. I'm just going to leave it there. And then after I'm done the move, I'm going to stop. Then I'll fix it. Then I'll go from E7 to D7. And the idea is you lift, move. Don't worry about the mistakes. Focus on the movement. One lift, one move, one down. That is the most important piece. It'll take a little more time to get this down if you do it this way versus the first way I did it with the visualizing and taking your time going slow. Uh, and you might, you know, it, it just takes a little more time to do it. A little, that could be a week, could be a month. Um, I mean, relative to the amount of time you're going to play guitar, it's, it's very small. But you need to do what motivates you and what works for you. That's the main thing I also teach is I learn to use people's personalities and I teach accordingly. And that's, that's how I would uh, approach that kind of thing. So do you have anything to add to that, uh, Anthony? Well, it's funny you mention it because that's exactly the way, like, uh, well, it's a similar way that I practice for myself and I also prescribe this kind of exercise for my students. Uh, and it works even after 20 years of playing or more than 20 years when dealing with like more complex chord changes. I wouldn't be able to play this without this kind of uh, exercise, without this tactical uh, advice you just gave. So thanks uh, to share this. And for the people who are here with us live during the live stream, you can ask questions if you have a certain challenge question that you want advice on, you want to ask something to either Mo or myself, feel free to share it in the chat during the stream. So um, Maurice, you were mentioning that um, <clears throat> a lot of people want to play like lead parts and we can talk about this of course uh, in a moment, but uh, going back to the rhythm part things, are there specific exercises for people who have a hard time strumming the chords? Yeah, so exactly. And um, the, the key to anything, so if you struggle with something, so strumming, for example. So if you struggle with strumming, um, the key is always, it, as far as I'm concerned, simplifying. It's always simplifying. So if you try to strum the most complicated pattern in the world, um, you know, probably most people are going to struggle with it. If you're a beginner, um, it's going to be a total disaster because you just don't have the coordination yet. Uh, there's not enough things that are automated. So what you want to do is you want to take uh, strumming to the lowest possible level that you need to. So for the two chords I just showed you, let's just say that I wanted to teach someone how to change those and strum at the same time. I would actually start very simply with strumming one, and then strumming the other. So basically strum one time each. And that builds your brain's ability to put all these things together. So now you can do an A7 chord or D7 chord. You can strum, you can change to an E7 and you can strum. You can change back to a D7 and you can strum. So that starts to build again, that process in your brain. We're mapping things out. If that's easy for you, then you could do, let's say, four beats per, per chord, just down strums, because that's one dimensional and your brain can handle this very well. All right. So if you just do four strums each and then the main thing is when you start getting into more strums, you want to just continue to do it in time. So the boss is your strumming hand. You got to make sure that your strumming hand keeps the beat. Everything is about timing and music, rhythm and timing, you're going too fast, you will make mistakes. So that's how you know if you're going too fast. You start making mistakes over here, and your hands don't go to the right places, your fingers go to wrong spots, so that's a little flag that's telling you slow down. Simplify, slow down. 
once you've got the hang of it at a slower speed, then you can start increasing the speed. If it, it's, you know, if you want to learn more complicated strum patterns, start slow. So once you can do it with those strum patterns, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to do it with a complicated strum pattern if you can't do it with what I just shown you so far, right? So build on those kinds of things. You can do a very complex, like more complicated strum pattern slowly and have success. So let's do, uh, you know, another one. Down, 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 up, down, up. That's a pretty popular strum pattern. So down, 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 up, down, up. I'm just going really slow. If you can't do that, slow it down. So it's all about building on what you already have. That doesn't mean you should stay at just downs forever. Um, you should challenge yourself and you should have some fun too. But if you want to develop your skill set and not get bad habits, you should really focus a lot of time and energy on doing it properly and finding that level where you can handle it and get success. So that's how I would teach people how to take the chords they know. And I would do this with chords I know, not necessarily the most difficult, one, difficult ones I just learned, um, and start to build my ability to stay in time and keep a rhythm moving. Because there's nothing more important than that flow and that timing in music. So that's, that's my approach there. All right, great. I want to add something about what you mentioned about strumming patterns like the down, up, down. Uh, it was down, 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 up, down, up, right? So this strumming pattern, whether you're using this specific example or other strumming patterns, can also be very good to develop your timing and timekeeping skills because a lot of beginners have... Um, um, experience difficulties really to do this while tapping the foot and like the strumming pattern that Mo just mentioned if you're experiencing trouble with tapping the foot along that pattern just know that it's also a great thing to practice it from a coordination point of view and to strip everything like Mo uh, was saying about we need to simplify things if, it, if they are too hard. And if you can't tap your foot, you need to simplify the strumming pattern by not using any rhythm on it. So you can do down and now I'm tapping my foot at the same time. And you can just use words if you want and just say foot and hand. And then you go foot and hand again. And then again, foot and hand. And then we have the hand that goes without the foot and then foot the hand again hand and in this way it might sound like ridiculous and it looks a bit ridic ridiculous probably but this is great practicing because now we are removing the barrier to entry and to tapping the foot while strumming along if this is too difficult simplify it by just getting the basic motions down and that's actually how I learned drumming. Um, a couple of years ago, I turned to the drum kit and then I started practicing without um, <clears throat> even drums. I just started practicing in the garden, practice each movement, each of the limbs. All of the limbs have to work together with the drums. And with the guitar, it's the same. If you're having trouble tapping the foot to a beat, just remove the rhythm for for a couple of moments and then just focus on the technical point of view. Right on. And yeah. want to note something that maybe people didn't uh, quite get the subtle thing that you did there is you weren't, you weren't using any chords here. You were just focusing on the strumming and tying that together with your foot. If you try to do too many things at once, it'll all go, it'll all break down. So that's why you want to simplify again. Just use, so you want to learn to tap to a rhythm, just do the rhythm in your foot. Do not add other things like chords or anything else. And that's how you learn it. And then when you can do it that way, then you might have success with chords, but it's going to be hard to do it when you do try to do everything at once. And that's one of the great dangers that, you know, when you're learning uh, from random sites and stuff, uh, that's the kind of stuff that I ran into and a lot of the students that I helped ran into as well. And they just, they couldn't do it because they're trying to do too many things at once, too complicated for them at their level. So there you go. Right. And oftentimes things that are labeled as easy or beginner, like yeah. easy 
course, beginner course, it's too heavy for most beginners because they don't simplify to the level that we're talking about right now. So I agree on having yeah. these resources that okay. beginners delve into, but then they find it difficult or too challenging for them to play. Correct. So I wanted to uh, take this, uh, so the rhythm, I wanted to take it to another level and make it a little more about blues now. Um, that, what we just talked about was just, you know, general um, rhythm. So one, there's one thing that, uh, that's very common in blues and it's uh, the, the swing beat or the shuffle beat. Um, you, you probably uh, know the difference between the, the two if, if they are better than me. Uh, you're the expert in that area, but um, uh, it's got a, kind of the same feel. So um, the idea is um, when you have uh, just a straight rhythm, you know, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Um, that's just what we call just straight uh, eighth note strum pattern. Um, and in blues, a lot of times what we do is we add this, this swing beat or shuffle beat. And what, what happens is you take those, those down and ups and you kind of skew them in a way. And I'm not going to get into the technical stuff. I'm just going to kind of give you the idea of how it works. And the way I teach this to people um, is um, I actually get people to, instead of doing down ups, I get people to start with just eight down strums. All right. Again, the reason I do this is because it simplifies it in your brain. It's a one dimensional strum pattern. And what happens is, so instead of doing down ups, I'm going to go down, 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 down. So eight strums. So eight strums would be four beats or one bar. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn that into a swing beat, shuffle beat. Okay. And, Let's start with just a, a straight one and I'll do the count and I'm just going to count using uh, numbers. Uh, it'll just be a little easier. Um, and so the count for eight down strums would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we want to add a shuffle beat, we're going to have to take all the odd numbers, all the down strums, the, 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 uh, the beats, and we're going to make them longer than the even strum. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you what it would sound like. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't like, actually I would do, probably do to four. I, I keep forgetting the seven does the, uh, there's two vowels there, or two uh, syllables. So let's do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So you notice that all the odd numbers are longer than the even numbers. And if you can visualize that, you can think about that, you can take a simple strum pattern and you can add a swing beat to it. Once you can do it with all downstrokes, then you can transfer to doing down ups. So once you can do it that way and you feel comfortable doing it, then you can do down, up, down, up, long, short, long, short, one, two, three, four, et cetera. So that's how I would transition into a more bluesy kind of um, shuffle swing beat from just a natural straight beat. If you can't do it with just straight downs or down ups, it's going to be very difficult to add that kind of texture, that kind of rhythm to more complicated scrum patterns. So I would start there and build from that. All right, that's a great exercise. Uh, I have a similar approach to this. I use like the Morse code thing. So it's again, probably like it's uh, semantics from what you said, but it's long, short, long, short. And then the long, I play it on the downbeat with my students. And then uh, we oftentimes start out with an up, uh, an upstroke on uh, the shorter version. So, it's... Yeah. And for people who haven't played those riffs, they are really essential uh, to get started with blues playing. I will share the tablature uh, at the end. I'll show you where to download all these examples if you want to get into this kind of style. But thanks, Maurice, for uh, for this. And we have uh, in the chat some um, comments. I will highlight uh, one 
if you want to take this uh maurice i struggle with chords ringing true says craig tend to mute open strings any ids and or training exercises so i think it's a great question that a lot of people might have so i have some thoughts about this but if you want to take this question maurice yeah no problem so um so there's some some interesting things I found uh, with people that tend to to mute uh, open strings. Now, if you just started learning guitar, like it's going to be very difficult for you to not mute the strings. Uh, there's really more important things to worry about at first when you first pick up a guitar, and that's basically coordinating everything, being able to put everything together. But let's say you've you've you're at that point where you can already kind of get a rhythm going, you change chords. It's not perfect, but at least you can get a rhythm going and you can change chords and you kind of keep that going. So that would be the, 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 the first thing I would make sure. Um, you can definitely work on accuracy um, if you use the method I showed earlier with, you know, make sure that you've got your fingers in the right spot and that Anthony showed us on how to make sure that everything is, uh, is ringing out clear when you're just working on individual chords or changing them very simply. But um, one thing I've noticed is a lot of people tend to play with guitars on their right legs. Okay, instead, I, I like to put it on my left leg, my, my chord hand. And what happens is the neck goes out, okay? It's, it's more comfortable, it's easier for some people to hold it, so I get it, and probably everybody on YouTube does it too. And, and that's fine, but when you do that, what happens is your wrist has to go all the way around to get those notes down. And it's very hard to get a good angle on it, especially when you're first starting. So it's very easy to have your fingers lay down just a little too much and start touching open strings. So one thing that I've been able to do with many people is just get them to switch their guitar over on their other leg on this side, kind of like how classical guitar players do it. Um, and what happens is magically their fingers raise a little bit and a lot of that noise actually goes away. Um, now, if you've just started, for most people, that's not a hard transition to do. If you've been playing for a while, um, that is a little more difficult, but at the end of the day, um, it's solved many problems, and that's one of them for most people. Now, that, that's not necessarily going to solve all the problems. Uh, the other thing is, when you're forming chords, if you're squeezing the neck, which can work, um, sometimes people squeeze it too much, all right, they wrap their, their hand around it. Um, if you're doing that, you're not going to get a very good angle on the notes. So again, you're going to probably touch other strings. So to if you want to get rid of that, one way you could do it is by just putting your thumb underneath, and that raises your arch, and you can get rid of it that way as well. Um, but again, if you're doing that with your neck forward, it's going to be very difficult on your wrist for most people. Um, so you have to be very careful about that. You do not want to injure yourself. Um, so those are the, the, the main things I would look for um, and correct. It's mostly posture that I found that causes those problems uh, once people have a, a good grip on things. Now, you may see some other things, but that's the main one I see. There's definitely other stuff, but I'll let you uh, comment probably on those, uh, Anthony. Yeah, I think for most beginners, if you just started playing yesterday, so to speak, it's really important to know that you there are lots of things that you need to develop. The strength in your fingers, the flexibility. Uh, we have so many uh, other things that we need to develop right at the same time. And we can't just use one of them, like the, the fine tuning of the fingers, and then forget about all the rest. Most of the time, it's all tied to each other. And like if you're just playing a C chord, for example, you might notice that your fingers at the beginning tend to do this, like they tend to drag each other down. So we need to build the strength in your fingers, but then also at the same time, the flexibility and the spread in your fingers. And then you have the calluses on the fingers. So, so if you're a perfectionist type of person, then you want to do it all at the same time, but you won't get a good mileage out of this approach because there's so many things, like I said. So you want to take it one step at a time and also be patient. And if you're 
practicing on courts, for example, and like Craig in the chat just mentioned that he has sometimes issues with chords ringing uh, out fully, like some of the strings are muted. If you're in this position, then uh, if you started playing yesterday, just play and don't worry about this little muting. If you've been playing on the other hand for a couple of months, of course, we need to check. That was string C chord. <laughs> you want to check each string separately and you want to delve into this kind of thing but while when you're playing for a couple of months the chances are that you developed a lot of things that need to be present and your fingers like the strength and flexibility i mentioned but if you just started out playing don't worry about the strings not ringing out especially if you're um, a perfectionist type because the only way to develop the strength and this flexibility and the calluses in your fingers is by playing a lot. And what perfectionists tend to do is they tend to stop practicing because they can't get it perfectly. And if they try to play each string separately and it doesn't ring out, then they're freaking out and they stop practicing altogether until they have it perfect. So if you're in this, <laughs> If you're in this group, I would say just practice your chords until you have the strength and the calluses and flexibility and your fingers aren't doing this. And then when you have the strength and all the other things, just focus on all the other strings, uh, well, uh, the, the strings ringing out true. So, all right. And then Robert in the chat is also sharing a comment about this exact topic. I, he's saying, I suggest um, use a lighter touch and form the chords with fingertips and not the fleshy part of your finger. So that's a great comment. Thanks for uh, it is actually, you know what? That's the other thing I was actually going to mention. Um, a lot of people want to make it sound good. So they push really, really hard. And what that does is it sinks into your fingers and it actually also causes you to touch the other strings. And that's where a really bad technique comes from, really. Uh, you need to have a light touch. You need to relax and not worry about perfection. Um, so good good job, Robert. That's uh, awesome. All right. So we have some great things to share. And uh, Maurice, we mentioned also in the beginning the lead part. Um, I'm going to invite you for another live stream so we can talk about playing lead if you're starting out. Um, these are great things, but you have um, something special for us that I'm going to share here on the screen. It's your beginner course. So for people who are live with us uh, or looking at the recording afterwards, maybe you can mention something about this course. Right on. So this, this course is, is great. It's, uh, it's been developed by experts. It's been used for years. I use it in my own offline school. Um, and I know many teachers around the world that use this course as well uh, in their offline schools. And the, uh, the, the nice thing about this course is it's good for total beginners. It'll teach you all the right things that we just talked about today. Um, and, um, you know, how to get your fingers the right way, how to, uh, you know, take care of, make sure you're, you have strength, dexterity and all the, those things and, and really work on your ability to do all the right things, teach the right techniques. So if you're starting out, it's a really good way to build the foundation strong from the beginning with the right things. If you already know how to play, this is an excellent course for someone who wants to find out if they have some gaps in their playing, you know, um, and I had tons of gaps, you know, when I started, when I finally found a, a teacher to help me, uh, I discovered a whole bunch of problems in my playing. And uh, this course is a really good way to learn how to find, identify, and then fix some of these gaps that you may have in your playing that could help tie things together for you and take you to the next level. All right, thanks for sharing, Maurice. So you can, people can get the course, it's uh, for sale uh, through the link below on your website for beginners. So you can check out that course there and i also have something it's uh, not for sale it's a free downloadable uh, ebook that you can get on my blues website it's best blues guitar lessons online.com blues rhythm guitar so all of the chords we talked about like the d7 b7 a7 chords examples 
also the refs that uh, the, the little riff that I showed you uh, is in that uh, rhythm ebook. And for people who are wondering, like, is it for me if I'm playing for a longer time? Yes, you can, uh, because a lot of the examples are tied into playing more advanced parts. Of course, we will start out with playing these little basic riffs, but then we tie it into chordal playing and shifting to other things like... a lot of this ebook um, that you can download for free on my website so the address is also there to be found at the link here so maurice thank you a lot for this live stream i hope you enjoyed it and i hope people got uh, a lot of out of this uh, i really enjoyed it and um, as i said I'll invite you for another live stream in the future so we can talk about the lead guitar playing part of things. So thanks, Maurice. Thanks for everyone who was with us here live on YouTube and Facebook. And we'll see each other in one of the next live streams. Then. Awesome. Right. Thank you very much. That was fun. Cool. Bye. Bye.